Apple overhauls its products ahead of the holiday shopping season. We've got all the highlights, including the new iPhones, upgraded Apple TV, watch, and iPad. I'm Emily Chang, and this is Bloomberg West. Coming up, Apple shows off faster iPhones with new touch interactions and better cameras that can shoot what they call live photos. How much will it drive sales? Plus, Apple TV gets its first makeover in three years and its own app store. And Apple unveils its supersized iPad Pro, complete with a keyboard and stylus, or as they call it, Apple Pencil. Is it a laptop killer? All of that ahead on Bloomberg West. It is all Apple today. Apple reveals the iPhone 6S and 6S Plus. New features include 3D Touch, a camera that can shoot 4K video and live photos that come to life. Think Harry Potter. We've got some of the most influential Apple watchers with me here in the studio, including Om Malik, partner at True Ventures, Ben Baharin, principal analyst at Creative Strategies, and Nikhil Bogle, co-founder and CTO of June, and a former Apple engineer who worked on camera technology there for a very long time. So there's a lot to talk about. Uh, but I want to start with, first of all, the event. Om, you gave it a 7 out of 10. Why just? <laughs> just seven? I think the, the only way you get to 10 is with Steve Jobs, but since he's not there, I just felt they did a good job. There was too many things. There were, during the event, you felt that there was good parts and they were lagging in some places. So I felt the, felt the pacing was a little off. Mm -hmm. But from a product standpoint, this was solid upgrade. So hence the seven from my So side. this is an iPhone company. Let's start with the iPhones. I went into the demo room. I got to try out uh, the, the two new phones. I saw the rose gold. I think I might, I think I might like that color. <laughs> um, but, but what do you think? You know, it's not a huge design change, Ben, but yeah. you know, there are some, some little things that are sure. significant. Yeah, I, I think there's a couple of interesting things. Like when you look at their product line, obviously people will look at it and say they look the same, and even Apple said, you know, but they've really redesigned everything. And so that starts again with the chip. I think things they're doing in, in the chipset to bring, bring about either faster capabilities, some of the games that they demoed, which when you see them, you're like, I can't believe those games are happening on a phone. Even the camera things you've talked about, a lot of that's being driven by those hardware changes, right? And all of those features from live photos to even just the 3D touch, that's not on other iPhones, right? And so you look at what's unique about the phone that's and I, and I would say you know it's not just a typical S year upgrade I think they did so much to this product that makes it stand out and important for that is it's not just appealing anymore to uh, Apple owners today it's appealing to switchers I think that the trend that we're seeing even in our data that there's they're seeing record number of Android switchers means that those features are now prepared and into place to position it and, and cater to new users for the first time so let's talk about some of the features let's start with the cameras the the front and back camera both got an yep. upgrade there's this new live photo thing uh, your screen will serve as flash if you want to take a selfie yep. um, which I like <laughs> but uh, Nikhil you know what strikes you about the new cameras um, so one thing to think about is that for the last four generations, Apple hasn't upped the megapixels, mm. right? So they've, since the iPhone 4S, they've been doing eight megapixels, mm -hmm. but at the now same- Now it's 12. Now it's 12. So, but four years is a long time to go without a uh, spec bump. Mm -hmm. uh, what a lot of people don't see is every generation adds new sophisticated software and image processing technology, and that's why the pictures keep getting better. Mm -hmm. So 12 is, such a meaningful number because it's 50% more pixels and they've been able to cram 50% more pixels into the same sensor size. So they've advanced um, sensor technology to be able to do that. Om, um, you, I think, love pictures more than anybody at this table. Uh, <laughs> what do you think about the new camera technology? How significant is it? When I tried out the live photos in the demo room, I was really excited about it when I thought of my kids, but it's kind of like a glorified GIF. Right. I think the think about the camera or whatever Apple does with the iPhone is basically if you're in, you are a company which makes products which are not high end, you're kind of out of business. I think Nintendo Wii is in trouble. I think all the point and shoot cameras should just, that market is all going to the smartphone. And this is probably better than my RX100 right now, the new iPhone 6 Plus. I can't wait to try it, right? Just, it is that good. The live, it's a little hokey, I mean. I think people, it'll get better. But people want, people like you, those kind of, you know, uh, little you gimmicks. Know, gimmicks and 
And I, I think there is something to it. Like the, the quality of the images is far superior than I've ever seen from my RX100, for example. What about the force touch? Well, it's called 3D touch. I'm not quite sure why they changed the name when it comes to the iPhone, because they call it force touch when it comes to the watch. But this is a whole new way of interacting with your phone. So for example, you can still tap to open an email, but if you press on it a little bit more deeply, it opens more shortcuts to the email. I mean, how dramatic is this? I think, you know, when you look at what they've done, there hasn't been any huge upgrades to, you know, multi-touch, right? All these gestures that they've brought for really some time. And this is kind of the first big upgrade or the new interaction level being brought to multi-touch. So that's why I think that's significant, particularly when you look back on multi-touch and remember that developers took advantage of that, right? Developers wrote apps and began to create new ways that we interact with their software through these new, you know, gesture paradigms that Apple brought. And now with Peak and Pop being kind of two of those, and I would expect more would come, those are now, you know, things that developers can take advantage of. And most importantly, do things really quickly, right? Just getting to deeper layers of an app without going into the app, right, was a good example. So eliminating five clicks, do it with one click right those little conveniences they add up they save time and they're nice it, how dramatic is this uh, Nikhil from an engineering perspective in terms of the technology to make this all work well <clears throat> the technology for pressure sensing has existed for a while but to be able to take that and mass produce it um, and fine-tune it so the user experience comes out great I think that's the challenge and Apple's consistently been great at that all right, so overall, are these updates going to drive sales? I mean, they had, a, what, 74.5 million phones shipped in the last holiday quarter. I've been told there's just no way they can beat that. I think it will. I mean, again, I you think, think they're, will. I think they're, again, the, the, from our data and the research that we're doing on these markets, it's just staggering numbers of people considering switching to the iPhone. Right? I think the market is maturing to a point where those who entered with low-end phones are looking to move up. And, and again, they're stealing in China. I just don't think people really fully grasp how big that opportunity is. And they keep making the point, right, 27% of the base is upgraded today. By the end of this quarter, it's probably 35-ish percent. Still a huge number. So it's not just their existing base. It's, again, they're, they're, they're selling to new users in ways they never did before. And so I think all those things compound, you know, so we're, we're pretty bullish it's going to be a big quarter. All right, Ben Baharan of Creative Strategies, O Malik of True Ventures, you're sticking with me, Nikhil Bogle of June, a former Apple employee. Thanks so much. Uh, really great to have you here on the show and get that behind the scenes. Thank you so much. Apple background. Now, last year, failing to own Apple was a mistake fund managers hope to avoid. But this year, that distinction goes to Amazon. Amazon has surged 67% this year, while Apple's up just 1.8%. In fact, the online retailer has contributed the most to mitigating losses in the S&P 500 this year. Amazon is enjoying a perceived safe haven status at a time when investors want nothing to do with emerging markets. The company gets 57% of its revenue from North America and is less exposed to global growth than its peers. By contrast, Apple has tumbled amid heightened concern over iPhone demand in China. A stock we're watching, another stock we're watching, Netflix, shares rising today. The company saying it will expand into Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore and South Korea earlier next early next year ceo reed hastings has also said he hopes to get netflix into china in 2016 last week when netflix started its service in japan the company plans to complete a global expansion by the end of 2016 so far netflix has over 65 million subscribers in 50 countries and shares have risen about hundred percent this year a third stock we are watching, JD.com, the China-based internet retailer rising for a second straight day. JD announcing a two-year share buyback initiative of up to a billion dollars, and shares continue to rise as investors bet on reports China will do more to stimulate its economy. Up next, the Apple TV Reimagined will break down its first big update since 2012. We've got some breaking news. Box just boosted its revenue outlook for fiscal year 2016, and its third quarter revenue forecast exceeds estimates. Box also says it surpassed 50,000 customers globally. CEO Aaron Levy will be on our show tomorrow. 
Now, continuing with Apple, I want to focus on the TV now because today we saw the first significant update that Apple's made to the set-top box in three years. Eddie Q was pretty excited about it. He even changed his shirt. The new product still acts as a gateway to online video from Netflix, Hulu, HBO, and of course iTunes. But now third-party developers will be able to make apps specific for a TV operating system called TVOS. And the remote also got a facelift with new touch features and Siri search capabilities. And if you have Apple TV, you're saying, thank goodness it's about time. Uh, but do consumers really need their TV to do everything that their iPhone and iPad can do? Joining me now, Horace Dadu, founder of a Simco, widely watched Apple analyst, Ben Baharin of Creative Strategies, and O Malik of True Ventures, still with me. So let's start with that question. Do I want to shop and plan my vacations on my television set? Definitely want to shop. <laughs> Of course, I want to shop. But no, does but everyone want to shop? Yeah, it's it's just made. I think this is the big thing people missed. This is the the big thing about the Apple TV was I was looking at the Gilt uh, co-founder right. make the presentation. I was like, wow, my addiction problems got way worse than I thought because now you can see video. You, I mean, it's not like a tiny screen you're shopping on. High fashion is perfectly shoppable on a big screen TV. That is huge. It's going to be huge. Just wait and see. Go ahead, Horace. The other thing is that it suddenly allows that experience of shopping to be a social experience. At least people in the same room can can interact with one another. It's the, the idea of you shop together. And that's very hard to do on a device. Mm -hmm. If you can imagine, you know, like if my wife wishes to, for example, buy furniture, she's going to have, have me huddle over the iPad and we're going to go through options. But suddenly you can relax, you can sit back, you can have friends over, you can discuss things like, does that outfit look good? You know, and you can put it all on the screen. And that's that's the thing is like what Apple just showed us is that you have wrist space, you have laptop space, you have desk space, and then you have wall space. Mm -hmm. And what I think is like when an app lives in these different spaces, it's going to get used differently. So what we see, for example, just, just as a note, Safari does not exist on wrist space, mm -hmm. does not exist in wall space. It does exist everywhere else. Safari as a you know proxy for all browsing. So if you think about it, now browsing is suddenly off limits in these places, or it doesn't make sense. It's, I wouldn't say it's being blocked. It just it's going to be a different space for a lot of apps. Tim Cook said this is the golden age of television, but the viewing experience hasn't changed very much. He said the future of TV is apps. You know, is that true, Ben? I think so. I mean, I think, again, what's interesting about the big screen, right, the TV, is that it's really never been a platform for developers, right? We are, most of us, if you live in a developed country, you've been beholden to a box that somebody gives you, and that hardware is pretty terrible. I mean, right, it's just there's no getting around how bad it is. And so having a platform that developers can take advantage of, right, and Apple has some of the best developers on the earth compared to any of the ecosystems out there, and saying, what would you do if I give you an SDK and you can do things with Siri or you can do things with the mic on the remote, and eventually maybe they put a camera in there, right, and start giving you more capabilities, what will their developers do with it and advance the platform? And that's always sort of the hook. But that's, that's I think, the interesting part of this is that we've never really seen a big developer community take advantage of the big screen because they've never had that as a platform before. I'm really excited about the search capabilities of the remote that I can just tell, tell, tell the remote, you know, find me new movies, new kids' movies, skip ahead seven minutes, wait, what did she say? It'll skip back um, 15 seconds. But TV, Apple TV, has been up to this point a niche product for Apple. Can it become a major product for Apple? Just one hundred forty-nine dollars. What do you guys think? I, I think again. I think you know these the. The hardware hasn't changed a lot, right? If streaming boxes and streaming sticks are the best that we've had, right? That's really not, I think, an expression of where this market goes, right? And a lot, again, it's been it's been the hardware. Like even in this conversation about commerce, the commerce has been bad. Like we haven't had truly interactive commercials where we can buy from that because the hardware has been so bad. And so we've needed a hardware revolution on the TV. And I think again, Apple said it, you know, clearly this is the foundation for the future of TV. We're maybe not there yet, but they're trying to put those pieces of the puzzle together. Things like apps, the new hardware. That's part of the skeleton, but it's it's again it's an evolving narrative. Just a step towards it. So I, I will take a contrarian position. I think this is a transition product. TV as we know it is on a big screen, you know, remote, changing channels, or watching apps, essentially the same thing. I'm of the belief that kids who are growing up today, they will they are growing up watching consuming video on the phone mm -hmm. and the phones which are like phablets, I guess. And that's where the future of television lies. I don't think it lies in those big screens. I think TV is going to be for our generation, maybe two generations behind us. 
but anyone who's in there like from ten, like age 5 to 15 that generation is growing up thinking about tv from youtube whenever they want just through a search and i think apple is very good at redefining the current paradigm and say okay this is great let's reinvent how people do things now mm -hmm. and then figure out what will happen later but i will i will go uh, you know against again and say that i think it's a good product for you know people who are not of the next generation. All right, O Malik of True Ventures, Ben Baharan of Cre Creative Strategies, Horace Tadu of Asimco, you are sticking with me. We're going to talk about the monster new iPad uh, after the break. Staying with Apple, CEO Tim Cook is reportedly attending a tech summit hosted by the Chinese government in Seattle later this month. The New York Times reports that China's internet regulator has invited several executives from Facebook, Google, Uber, and more to a forum co-hosted by Microsoft. Alibaba founder Jack Ma has also confirmed he's attending. The event will coincide with President Xi Jinping's first state visit to the United States and comes amid warnings from Washington that it could hit Chinese companies with sanctions over digital attacks for trade secrets. Up next, Apple's new partnership with a French luxury powerhouse will tell you which classic designer is going high tech with Apple and the Apple Watch. Plus, why Apple is betting on the iPad Pro. This is the iPad Pro. It's the most capable and powerful iPad we've ever created. It is chock full of amazing advanced technologies and innovation. And it is time now for the Daily Bite, one number that tells a whole lot. Today's bite is $1,100. That is the starting price of the Hermes strap for the Apple Watch, and perhaps the splashiest part of the watch update today. Apple partnered with the French luxury brand to create leather straps for the standard stainless steel model and a trio of special faces that resemble traditional Hermes watches. And if you want the Hermes strap and watch face, just 1500 bucks. Now to the iPad, the larger iPad designed to attract business users, but also musicians, designers. Apple says the iPad Pro is faster than 80% of the PC shipped in the last two months. It even comes with a stylus, or as they call it, Apple Pencil. But is it going to jumpstart demand for the iPad? Here with me now, John Jackson, Vice President of Mobility Research at IDC, is with us from outside uh, the Apple event. Horace Dedu, founder of Asimco, here with me in the studio. Ben Baharan of Creative Strategies, also with me, Om Malik partner at True Ventures. First of all, Horace brought his two iPads, and if you put them together, it actually shows the size of the new iPad Pro, 12.9 inch. It's, a it's huge. Bit. Yeah, it's approximately two iPads. Mm -hmm. They actually show the old iPad turned on its side, and then you add quite a bit more to get the full size. And as a result, what you end up with is essentially the dual screen capability. And so if you go into portrait mode like this, for example, you can simulate, as an analyst, we love this stuff. We have data here showing Apple versus Microsoft, and we would be able to do a side-by-side -side comparison, scrubbing through the years, being able to see changes in the behavior of the two companies. And that's just like going from a bathtub to a swimming pool. Mm -hmm. The way I see it, it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's all containing water, but it's just so much more room. John, do you think that the iPad Pro is enough to bring iPad sales back to life. I think it's enough to move the needle a little bit. You know, we were certainly expecting it. There was some foreshadowing around this with the announcement of iOS 9 and some of the capabilities that Horus is uh, demonstrating right now. But uh, not uncoincidentally, it's priced the exact same as the uh, Surface Pro 3. Uh, and you know, really, this is the um, we're after the enterprise market here. Uh, according to Intel, there are about a billion PCs in the world that are poised to be refreshed, so it's a big market to kind of fight for. To me, uh, I think the jury is out on whether there's enough uh, here uh, in this product, and certainly there's some innovation here, uh, but whether there's enough uh, to kind of cement it and really move the needle forward in a material way for Apple. Now, there was a much retweeted quote from Steve Jobs in 2010 who said, if you see a stylus, they blew it. Is Steve Jobs turning in his grave right now? Pretty much. I think this is a very consensus-driven move by a company which is becoming very mediocre 
in terms of marketing and not being very clear in where it needs to go. Mediocre? Okay. Yes, Do yes, either of you have a yes. problem with that word? Uh, let me finish. <laughs> like, the stylus was the thing he marked for a reason because iPad meant having a whole new set of gestures, interactions, and class of applications. They have actually swung back to being median and mediocre from that standpoint. Big, big screen or not, you know, it doesn't make any difference. I think the stylus is a step back because it has uh, added one more layer of cognitive overload to, to already complex device which is out there, the iPad. I, I vehemently disagree. Um, the difference between this pencil and the stylus is that the stylus was meant to act as a pointer, essentially replacing a mouse, and that is a fault, or in the sense of Steve Jobs saying this, they blew it. This device is actually a tactile object that actually conveys the, sensor, the senses of the hand onto the screen. And the difference is that it's never intended to be about addressing the screen. It's meant to actually allow you to draw. That's why it's called pencil, not stylus. So I think it's you can live your entire life without it, and you be have a great iPad experience. If you press more lightly, it's a thin line. If you press more deeply, it's a, drawing it's a bold tool. line. All semantics. Okay, I think this is. I spent last four years learning a whole new set of, you know, uh, gestures, interaction with the device, with the 3D touch. They're expecting me to learn more gestures, and then they bring in another device to add more complexity. I think. From that standpoint, I'm on the maybe on the extreme end of it, but I do feel this is like a you know retro a great move from there. I, I think again, the market changes, the market evolves, right? Consumers are becoming more savvy, you know, and I think this product catering to a diverse set of use cases, being that drawers and artists now have a tool with pencil precision, which if you try it, you're like, okay, this is actually really, really good. There is a market for that. It's it, again, it's not everybody. You don't have to use it. My kids, exactly. my wife, my grandparents, people who love the iPad today and, and benefit from its capabilities, in no way, shape, or form have to use it. it it's an option. Right. You don't have to use it. There is touch, there is stylus, and there is a keyboard. Believe me, that's not the Steve Jobs way. Okay, just... we're going to have to leave it there. Steve Jobs, though, did change his mind many times and quickly. Um, uh, but uh, O Malik of True Ventures, Ben Baharan of Creative Strategies, uh, Horace Tedu of Asimco, John Jackson of IDC, thank you all so much for joining us. We're going to be watching to see how these sell over the holiday quarter. But a big announcement from Apple today that does it uh, for this edition of Bloomberg West. Don't miss Aaron Levy, Box CEO, tomorrow.